Welcome, everybody, to The Viewing Room. We are going to be discussing The Pacific, the 2010 HBO series follow-up to Band of Brothers. I have Jennifer Buoni, Mark Pellegrino, and Jax Schumann with me, as always, to dig into the themes, the characters, the acting, the what it all means, and how to help you get more out of your viewing experiences. So I just want to like raise the hands because I don't want to shout it out for you guys. Who did not see this prior, like when it came out, 2010? Who's new to the Pacific? Okay, wow. Okay. Everybody so I did not see you, Kirk. I did not see it in 2010, but I have seen it several times before. But uh. um, so if you're not familiar with the Pacific and you know, we've done an episode on Band of Brothers. Just one quick thing. This story, this 10 episodes, covers, I think, the 1st, the 5th, and the 7th Division of the Marine Corps in their uh, three characters in particular, uh, Sledge, Lucky, and Basilone. And it covers their experiences in Guadalcanal, uh, uh, Okinawa, Iwo Jima, Peleliu, and a variety of other places in the Japanese Pacific Theater of War. So we're going to talk a little bit about that and how it's all structured. But first, we need to go into our thumbs up, thumbs down, or thumbs sideways of your experience, your first or whatever experience of this. So I'll go from on my screen left to right. So that's Jennifer first. So I give it a, a sideways. like Sideways? Okay. Yeah. Like I, I enjoyed it, but I didn't love it. Like, okay. and, and I think, are we talking about the themes yet? Well, just, just your 20 second reaction, like thumbs yeah. up, thumbs up, your, your Cisco I, Eber, well, thumbs up, thumbs down. Okay. Well, I'll keep it. I'll keep it. But I think it's because the theme itself and the characters, they had good arcs, but I think um, the theme was just a little bit of a, um, a downer compared to other previous things we've watched. That's that's all I'll say. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I give it uh, thumbs up, one thumbs up, not two thumbs up. I really liked it, and I agree. There's something a little bit different in other things we won't mention at the beginning, <laughs> but we'll mention a, the show a little bit later as in that. But I I did really like it on its own merits for a lot of reasons that I'll discuss. But uh, how about you, Mark? A uh, hard thumb sideways. Hard thumb sideways. Okay. <laughs> yeah, there were there are elements uh, uh, that I liked about the narrative and the thematic elements uh, and elements that really bothered me, but we'll talk about that. Um, okay. Yep. And Jax, I give it a a thumb sideways with a thumbs halfway up <laughs> because the last the last two episodes made 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 me go from here to a little bit mm -hmm. here. Yeah. Even episode nine, huh? Even episode nine, yeah. Oh. Episode nine was um, oh Okinawa. Oh, what, what happened to so Okinawa? Okinawa, yeah. So this, just so everyone knows, if you haven't seen this, the viewing room yet, we are going to have spoilers soon. So if you haven't watched the Pacific, I really recommend you go see that, even though we have tepid responses to it so far. Um, <laughs> but before we get into an actual discussion of it. Just like Band of Brothers, which I'm going to have to say at this point, we had a kind of, his, this is a real historical event. This this really happened. Many people in our lives, you know, experienced this. Like we, many of us know people who were in World War II, um, grandparents and so on. And so I, I thought if we had connection, so I don't actually have a connection to, as far as I know, in my uh, family to the Pacific, um, I do have connections to the European well, theater of war, which I talked about last time. But does anybody here have a connection to the Pacific that they want? We, like I, maybe we can talk about the real and then we'll go I into do. the story. Okay, a yeah, couple. Of them. I do as well. I think Marx is more dramatic. So I'll I'll share okay. mine first. My my grandfather on my mom's side was in the Navy and he was stationed off of the the um Great uh what Great Barrier Reef in Australia. That that's all I know. Oh, okay, uh, but he did. He didn't. He's not as dramatic as Marx. Yeah, how about you, Mark? So my stepfather was, I believe, in the first Marine Division. So he he was in the Battle of Midway, Guadalcanal. 
I don't think he might have ah. been he might have been the rotated out by the time they went up to Okinawa because I don't remember hearing any stories, which I never heard directly from him. I, I heard through other family members. Um, uh, he was in he was in. And one of the things that disturbed me a little bit about the Guadalcanal thing, and, and perhaps it's something that's super hard to do aesthetically. They, I never quite got exactly the, the kind of insanity from Guadalcanal from the Pacific that was communicated to me from my stepfather. Mm. Because what you have to realize is, uh, this is where the thin red line also disappointed me because it sort of came in after all the drama with the Marines and came in with the army's cleanup. The Marines were surrounded, which they which they suggest, because the, there's the American fleet gone, which is supposed to be backing them up. And they were outnumbered 10 to 1 by the Japanese. I never got that sense. And you get the sense through the night charges that there's, you know, these crazy kamikaze-esque Japanese that are just sort of flooding the front lines and will, are ready to die. Um, but you don't understand that they're they're cut off from food and water for something like two weeks. Uh, you get you they they allude to it, but I never I, I I didn't I didn't quite think that I could that I related to the suffering and the and the uh, terror that those men must have been experiencing the way I could when I heard it through my stepfather, who by the way came home with awful PTSD, um, and 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 it was a issue that I think plagued him for the rest of his life. Mm -hmm. When I was two, he apparently held us all hostage in a campground when he was drunk, had a gun, thought there were Japs in the woods and, and held us hostage in, in our, uh, in our, in our uh, trailer the whole night until he sobered up. Wow. Wow. Jeez. Oh my God. Yeah, you think about, cool. you think about a man who volunteered for the Marine Corps at 18 years of age when the war broke out and then to be subjected to that kind of terror at that age. Oh yeah, that does. It. And so, Moving into like the themes, because I think that's a good segue in the sense of one of the things that's unique or that that I thought they were trying to do, and I do have some things about why they probably didn't fully land, stick the landing of what they were trying to accomplish and why so many, if you look at reviews, and I'm just going to mention the other uh, story of Band of Brothers, it's it's always the kind of tepid, like, oh, I liked it. It was interesting. It was good. But there was, there, you don't see a lot of reviews that are just enthusiastic love that you do, for example, with Band of Brothers. And it's an unfortunate thing because I think the Pacific has a lot of strengths, but it doesn't stick the landing in a couple of ways thematically. And I think, Mark, what you're alluding to is one thing that Band of Brothers, you know, I, I'm trying not to say that too much, but uh, the Pacific really focuses on in a way that other war films discuss, and it's part of them. I and mean, maybe Deer Hunters about this, if you've seen that movie, but is the real all the the negative as, as, um, aspects and after effects of the war. And because again, with this story, you get a, a lot more of home life. That here you get, you're they're really home. Right, they're home for a while. It starts at their homes. It ends the, the whole last episode is them going home, and you know each of the different stories. So again, the three strains of story to focus on is the story of Robert Lecky, the story of John Bassalone, and the story of Sledgehammer. And I'm forgetting Sledgehammer's name. Uh, Eugene. 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 Thank Eugene you. Sledge. Um, and <laughs> they're they're both they're all three very interesting to discuss, but so. Let's talk about the, the themes, what we saw in terms of the plot and story elements in these three characters, and does it unite into anything holistic? And I think it kind of does, but we'll, I don't, I'd be curious your, your thoughts on any thematic elements of these characters. I, yeah. I felt like the theme was what this kind of war does to the soldiers, um, in various ways. So from Lecky, you get a more typical soldier point of view um, where he's, you're seeing not just how it's affecting him. Cause he does get the, he, the name of that, whatever he's peeing on himself, but it's really just to get him over to the, um, the uh, hospital where he can witness worst case scenarios. 
Mm-hmm. So the crazy making, the lack of sleep with 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 um, the Japanese soldiers interrupting them in the middle of the night, how they can't sleep and how I love my favorite line of the whole show was um, they murdered sleep. If you don't mm. have sleep, you don't have health. You, you know, like you, you've got to have your sleep. And if, imagine if they've, like Mark was saying, murdered it for the rest of your life. Mm. Um, but also you see the, the, it, it, how it creates suicide in some people and other soldiers. It makes them maniacs, like turning into psychopaths, the guy that was like strangling the Japanese guy. And I think Sledge's arc really showed how he could possibly have lost his soul. Mm-hmm. You have his his father, the doctor, saying, I, I, I've seen these men come back from the Great War, and 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 I just don't want to see you lose your soul. And you, you see him come to that point where he almost loses his soul, and then he somehow gets it back. Uh, so to me, the theme is just all of these different various negative things that can happen when soldiers go to this kind of war. I think that's, that's really accurate. I would agree with a lot of that. Anybody else have thoughts on the theme? Yeah. I mean, I would say the theme is war is hell. Um, And what you get, what you get out of it with, when you follow the characters, the three main characters, one of whom unfortunately dies in Okinawa, one of the better characters unfortunately dies in Okinawa. Yeah, what I got out of it that's hopeful is the durability of the human spirit, because there there are characters like Sledge, who, who who's a really predominant character in the second half of the series, who you do get concerned. You see his arc from idealistic young kid who who is sort of chomping at the bit to get into the war to a uh, a, a xenophobic, racist, murdering thug. I mean, he's actually going in that direction. And when he comes back, and he's, uh, you can see that his mind is still back in Okinawa. It's still back fighting in the Pacific. It's still, it's still um, burdened by by all, all the the uh, cruelty that he engaged in and that he saw. And you don't know if he's going to come out of it, uh, really. Of course, um, there's a, a sort of relieving, this is a huge spoiler, but the credits at the end, you actually get introduced to the real characters. And mm-hmm. this is something that's, really remote from you when you're watching the, um, the, 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 the film. And it's, it's, it's a little off-putting because what you see in the, in the, in the previous series that we were discussing is, is fraternity and the fraternity is right. something that unites them. And there's a pride, a fraternal pride in, in, in the uniqueness of what they're accomplishing, what they're doing. There's zero fraternity in the core and the core mm-hmm. sort of always comes off as a proud unit, but these guys, these guys are cruel to each other in in, yeah. in more often unless they're friends and uh and and cruel to the enemy in a way that's off-putting so 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 off-putting that you, i mean the one shining moment is this character snafu who's sort of fallen down the rabbit hole of cruelty in his own way when he plucks the gold teeth out of the mouths of the dead japanese forbids his friend sledge from doing the very same thing as he's about and to go say to- and i think that was like he saved him at that he, he saved he him did. from losing his soul that was one of the more noble and interesting arcs between those two characters that that i saw how how protective a, a, a nihilistic character like snafu becomes in the end for somebody who's falling down that same rabbit hole I thought it was a, a beautiful moment too when they're on the train back and it's uh snaf they stop at um Snafu's station back in I think New Orleans and uh and and he leaves a peacefully sleeping sledge. You know, it's uh, he he doesn't say goodbye to him. It's almost it 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 was it was a really well done moment. I'm not quite sure exactly what it conveyed, but it it was almost like he was kind of like I'll 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 remove my toxic self from your presence now because you don't like you don't need me anymore uh to protect you um but I their 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 romance I thought was really interesting mm-hmm. um but I mean in in terms of in terms of theme yeah that what I I got exactly what Jennifer said what Mark said the only thing that I'll add to it is that um it was it was also just showing the different kind of enemy that the Japanese were compared to the Germans, um, relentless. I mean, just relentless. And it, and you know, we 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 could you know have have a discussion about did 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 that actually make it you know 
make a case for dropping the bomb. Like after you see mm. how absolutely relentless they are. And and the the one, I think it was in episode nine where the Japanese are 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 literally putting their own people in front of them. You have soldiers mm. that are taking civilians putting them in front of them and strapping bombs to them, you know, where have we seen that before? And uh, it, but, but to actually see them, we, you know, we, we talk about like war theory, like, oh, using people as human shields. Well, they're literally doing that. They literally put women and children in front of them as they're, you know, pushing through the trenches, trying to, to kill the soldiers. It just, the 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 nature of the enemy was just on a whole different level from the Germans, despite the the horrific things right that the germans did to the jews it, it's just a completely different kind of enemy yeah so i definitely want to talk about that aspect of it there's something about the the or there's something in the arcs that of each of these that i wanted to go over with you guys really briefly before we move on to that so i mean one it, there seems to be a, an interesting similarity between lecky and sledge but not between john Barcelone. And there's an inch, there's a difference, and I do think they they chose those three obviously for a reason. You in the sledge, as you mentioned, he has a heart murmur. He cannot go to war. He actually gives to his friend Sid this book, Barrack Room Ballads by yeah. Rudyard Kipling. It's it's very romanticized. They're romanticizing war. That's a big part mm -hmm. of this story, I think, is the romanticization of war versus the rea what becomes the reality of it, and mm -hmm. you. You, uh, for instance, there's a character when they're in the first episode. Can't remember his name. He's one of the friends of. Uh, he's one of the good friends of Lecky, and he talks about he's gonna he, he's gonna line them all up. You're like, I'm gonna take out a whole mm -hmm. Jap regiment, line them up, and shoot them down like a turkey shoot. And the yeah, and and you know, Lecky says, I don't think it's gonna be quite like that easy, but it is that easy. That's the crazy thing is like that. I think it's the next episode, or maybe even be at the end of this episode. No, I think it's the next episode. But anyway, literally, there's a whole sea of bodies, and they just keep running at machine guns, and it's like a turkey shoot. And part of the difference, I think, in the theaters of war that they're trying to convey in this story is this element of the tenacity of the Japanese warrior and how they just don't have any inclination for human life. It's just yeah. throwing massive torrents bodies. of bodies. I mean, there's a scene in the Guadalcanal where John Bassalone's character literally pushes a mound of dead bodies so they can have a dead mm -hmm. Japanese bodies. So yes, they're surrounded. And and so, I, you know, I by the way, I, I did get a little bit more of a sense of their surroundedness, Mark, than I think you did. This is one of those scenes where it's like, they're just slaughtering everybody. So they are surrounded, but they're just like, killing everybody to mount. And then he has to go out there and push those bodies. And, you know, that it's, to me, it was just, they were conveying the, the filmmakers and the artists were trying to convey something unique about this war in comparison to the other theater of war. And you see that with, you know, the John Bassalone character, he goes through this, he has this heroic moment, he gets all this honor and glory, and then he wants to go back. And as Mark alluded to, his desire to go back. He, this is the only boot camp scene we have is I think with him teaching the next generation. Then they go to, um, what is, he's Iwo Jima, right? And then he, that's where he, you know, dies in quote unquote glory. And, you know, the lecky or the, excuse me, the sledge scene starts with a heart murmur. Once he has this romanticized view of war goes off to war he tries to hold on to his humanity on some level, like you said. And then in the end, he wants nothing to do with guns, with his uniform or anything like that. He doesn't want yeah. any of the benefits that he could be getting. Like he be, could be like, he's literally over and over and over again told you can get like one, you went through the whole war war without having sex. Like his friend says, are you kidding me? That's crazy. Um, <laughs> and they, cause they have a whole scene where there's like, lots of sex going on. Right. Okay. Uh, and then you have this whole sequence where like women are being thrown at these men. Right. And he doesn't want anything to do with it because, because of what he went through emotionally. I think that's a very powerful thing that you would think of all the things, get the rewards, 
that of all the things you went through and he's not going to do it. I, I thought that was an interesting arc as well. I don't know if you guys had anything else to say. I, about thought, he had, I thought he had the most interesting arc. He certainly had the most yep. clear, clear arc of all of all the characters. Yeah. I think Ross alone sort of comes, you know, sort of fully baked, like uh, almost like a Howard Rourke type. Yeah. He's a, he's a kid from New Jersey, uh, you know, who, who finds out that he's really good at, at soldiering, you know? And one of the things that I thought was interesting, uh, uh, the, the contrast between what he, what he brings to teaching the, the young crowd of soldiers coming up to fight the Japanese and what, they, what, what his group uh, thought of the Japanese, which was, we're going to kill these guys. They're, they're a turkey shoot. But when the, when the generation he's teaching says they're going to do the same thing, he's like, don't you ever underestimate these people. They, they will run yeah. at you. They will run straight into your machine gun fire. And, and here we have something surfacing, I think, that surfaced in the other show, which is a respect among soldiers for the mm. type of courage that it takes. Uh, we would consider it probably uh, insane and not, not, not necessarily from a good psychological place. But certainly taking a lot of courage to storm a, a front, a, a line that's heavily dug in, uh, where you're probably certain to die, and that a soldier can understand the kind of courage that that takes in a, in a way that no other human being can. Yeah, uh, and then tries to relay that to the next generation, which I thought. Well, and I think that's a powerful scene because he is talking about, um, like you're saying, he's he's trying to convey the reality of the soldier versus the romanticized caricature they have in their head, which is this, you know, racist, rice-eating, you know, Jap that's easy to kill. But he says, this guy has been at war since you were in diapers. He knows more about war than you'll ever know. Never underestimate your enemy. And, you know, like it's this this idea, I think this, and the reason I'm bringing this up, I think this goes to a, one of the deep themes of this, of this particular story and uh, not just the John Barcelona, but the Pacific one of this idea of war versus the reality of war. And because, you know, I'll bring in the comparison to Band of Brothers, which I said I wouldn't do, but I think the action sequences in this story are actually somewhat better in a certain sense, in the sense of it's grittier and more realistic. It's that's, that's the, I mean, I've never been in war. I don't know which one is more realistic, but it, it has more of the, to me, like I felt their thirst on Peleliu when they were really, and they found that goat head, right? And th that they had poisoned that river. Like they were really going through it. I like, and there's just, there's the maggots and, there's, there's and the rice. With, yeah, the maggots and the rice. I mean, and there's just, I think there's literally more action, like just pound for pound in this story. But I think it's because they're going after the terror of that, you know, what they went through, which was a unique aspect it was i gotta say though that that was kind of maybe one of my issues i guess with it mm -hmm. um and uh in in like just just comparing two episodes like from band of brothers versus um versus yeah. the pacific and hey yeah, you open the door so I know. like go as, for it as, it's, it's as the lawyers not, say yeah. you know you you open yeah. the door i get it's to, impossible I get to cross not examine to, yeah um but uh in so I look at um, uh, the episode on on Guadalcanal in the Pacific versus Bestone in um, uh, Band of Brothers, where they're freezing, right? Yeah. And you just in in Bastogne, you just get a sense of how freaking cold it is and how miserable they are and how they're being just you know bombed and and bombarded by the Germans, but it's not as graphic as Guadalcanal it's and, and in general Band of Brothers is not as graphic as um as the Pacific and I almost felt like that was a bit to the detriment because at some point it just got to be too much like sensory overload where like mm. I just kind of had to look away and I couldn't yeah. and, and I I couldn't place myself in it in the in the way that I could with um with Bastogne um and and I I wonder if that is, um, you know, the way that just better TV maybe, or it was just, it was better done because if, if you show too much or if it's too graphic, if it's too, too much input, too much sensory, like you can't, um, 
feel safe, I guess, to, in a way you can't like, as, as a viewer, you can't feel safe to just like really be immersed in, in the, the kind of tragedy and trauma that they're trying to convey. So to, at, at a certain point with Pacific, there were, there were certain graphic points that came and I'm not a person that shies away from violence and, you know, pulp and whatever, but um, it just, it, it got to a point where it almost like kept me at like an arm's length. And I couldn't get fully into the the mood of it. Um, so yeah. I mean, I'll I'll take Mark's word. What you know, when his uh, when his his stepfather like described how surrounded they were, I didn't get that sense in the same way that I got how freaking cold they were in Bastogne. Well, yeah, I have to agree. I wasn't as sensorily engaged either. And mm. even though there was more, there was more grit and it was more gruesome and disgusting in a lot of ways. One of the most horrific scenes was when sledge is sitting there and he hears mm. a plop plop yeah. plop and he looks up and it's snafu throwing rocks volcanic oh. into the head of a japanese soldier and now that's certainly gruesome but uh and and arresting in in all the wrong ways but with the guys at bastion it may be because it was a, much more fraternally executed so that i felt much more of a camaraderie with the men who were there bastion was like i was dying during that episode i mean i was freezing <laughs> i i was feeling their discomfort Threw on another blanket I, I couldn't get on the and i couldn't get on the page and maybe jax is, is right there was yeah. there was a little too much uh, stimulation I, just to divert a little bit one thing that i thought would be in that wasn't was a terrifying episode that my stepfather said would happen. If they captured an American soldier, they allude to it because Leckie's writing and they and they say, hey, you, you don't want to write stuff, man. You get caught. It's either Sledge or, or, or Leckie's writing. If you get caught, they're going to use that. That's intelligence. Well, they would catch American soldiers and they would use your name and identification against you. So at night, when my when my stepfather was out in the perimeter or whatever it was, you know, uh, as as uh, pickets, let's say, watching to see if the enemy would come, they would hear their names being called mm. from the jungle in Guadalcanal. But th they could tell that it wasn't they that they it would they were pretending to be the wounded friend who was left out there in the jungle, mm. and they would call yeah. their friend's names. They would they would have tortured that person enough to get names of his buddies, and they would call his buddies. Can you imagine how haunting? Uh. Horrible that yeah. would be. Now, that yeah. would be a nightmare, and I never saw that in the Guadalcanal section. And I and I and I wanted. Yeah. To, they did it in what? Iwo Jima, the Sands of Iwo Jima, with. Uh, oh yeah, with, with uh, the Clint John, Eastwood. No, with John Wayne. I, they might oh. have done. They might have done. They might have done it in Iwo Jima, the the Eastwood film. But in in Sands of Iwo Jima, the men who are sitting out in the foxholes, they hear somebody calling their name, and they think it's their injured friend. Yeah, wow. so sad. Yeah, that's, yeah, that, that, I mean, it's, um, I'm curious if you guys have any other thoughts on the theme, because I, I had something that was unique that is, I, I don't know if it's unique, but it's something that I was noticing and watching it again. So I've seen it a couple times, but the, um, one of the things I, I've noticed in this first episode in particular is how self-aware the story is of the story of d-day for instance so uh, and this goes back to the the kind of idea i was talking about with what is the the glory or the honor or the fantasy the romanticism of war you have before you actually experience it and i, I think a lot of us probably have people in our lives that we've known like this i had a friend when i was maybe 19 20 years old he was younger than me and then he went to, he joined the Marines. And I really think to this day that a big reason is because he liked Call of Duty and he, there was a kind of honor to it. And, and he lost both of, both of his legs in Afghanistan. He stepped on an IED. And I, like, I, I don't know why exactly he joined the Marines other than there was a kind of romanticism in his head of this, that glory that you get. And then, if, you know, of course there's this reality. And this story, this first episode really has this um awareness of it and the example i have of this is the the storming of the that first island that Le uh, lecky is going on remember it's this build up there's all this build up mm -hmm. they go on those water boats a, and if you look at it to 
Saving Private Ryan, I really think there's certain almost shot for shot exam exactly the same. It's like yeah. a shot on the one character, a guy throws up, another guy yells at him. There's like yeah. a, it covers the head. It goes, to, you know, above the boat. So you see the other boats, you never see the Island. It's this anticipation. Everyone's, and then you get there and <laughs> you know, they're like eating coconuts. Like finally you get here. <laughs> what I think that the they're saying, and I think it's a great thing of doing it is like the filmmakers and the artists wanted to really convey just how vastly different this was from the other theater of war, that this was a in the mud dirt. There was like, I'm not saying that's not the same of the theater of war in Europe. I think both wars I'm, I had brutality on both sides, but in the, the mind of the person at home, there was a big difference. I mean, J the Japanese are the ones who attacked us. We all know everything or much more about the European theater of war. People didn't even know about Pevavu. Pevavu? Like there's that one where they talked about like people and they like fought, a, they fought a whole battle one of the most brutal battles in the whole the, oh, both sides of the war. And it wasn't even purposeful. They they went to another island or something like that, right? Like that kind of thing is mind blowing to me. And I don't know much about the Pacific. I really, uh, you know, I honestly don't. I know a lot about the Battle of the Bulge and D-Day and, you know, the even African war or African battles, but not this. And I think it's interesting that that's a big focus they had of, that they were trying to do. I mean, even on the last episode, Jackson, I know you just finished this, but if you remember, like one of the things is that the Marines like Sledge, they didn't actually get all that, that, you know, celebratory kissing of the the sailor kissing right. the woman. They didn't get that. They came six months later, yep. which is very representative of the whole story. The whole story of the Pacific. It's like these guys fought this dirty, muddy thing, killing the most men of both on all sides of the war, which is the Japanese and having some of the biggest losses. And people are like, yeah, you know, thanks. Right. And that's not what happened to the the people who came back from Europe and there's the celebration, not to say they didn't deserve it, but it's just a different story. So I don't know what you think about that. I think, yeah, I think also it um, it's a different, like, like I was saying before, it's a completely different enemy. And um I think they, I, I think the show had a better opportunity to, and uh, maybe a missed opportunity to actually show how they were a different kind of enemy. Um, they, you know, they were um, trying to like gather my thoughts here. They, they almost, I, I think that they, they almost saw them as like aliens. They, they, you know, they, mm. There was there was there was a language barrier with the Germans, right? But they at least they kind of like I hate to, at least they kind of looked alike. Well, the uh, Western and 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 yeah, and they um, but they in Band of Brothers they had them kind of interacting more with the soldiers with the German soldiers, and you don't see any of that kind of interaction with um, with the Japanese soldiers. I thought probably one of one of the most this was an, a, a soldier in our interaction, but one of the most amazing scenes to me was when Sledge, I think it was episode nine, when um, when Sledge goes in and, and they um, they hear a baby, right? They hear a baby mm -hmm. and they think, oh, it's probably a trap. Uh, mm -hmm. And But they go in and the baby's crying. The baby was nursing at his mother's breast and the mother is, is dead. Uh, they somebody you know finally picks up the baby and and takes the baby away but then sledge goes into another room and there's a woman who is dying from a um a mortal wound to her belly but she gets takes the gun from sledge and and puts it to her forehead uh and i mean it was it was just this amazing moment and then he puts the he he drops the gun puts sets the gun down and then cradles her basically and allows her to die in his arms um I think that they had better opportunities for more scenes like that um, because it, it it just it it just showed the complete like I don't know wall or barrier between um, between this enemy and um, and the the European enemy, um, but I, I think they could have done a better job of that though. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I guess I'm I. I'm not a hundred percent sure I understand the because the German in the in the German 
side and, and band of brothers, we, we only get a little bit of interaction. Like we get the story of the one um, Lieutenant who kills all those men. And that you see, so you see the men, I don't know if we get that many interactions with the German soldiers that I remember there are it was, it never, There's it was, the one who's from America who goes over. Well, that's right. Yeah. That's the sequence where the Lieutenant, you know, supposedly mows down all the POWs. Yeah. But in the Pacific, but then also they were they were interacting with the Germans, um, especially when they when they found the concentration camp. Um, well, that's the German the, c- civilians, right? Yeah, the, yes. it was. Yeah, yes. it was we the didn't civilians, get civilians, but they also had they like there, that. There, there, okay, we, there was that whole speech that the um, that the German yeah, general okay. gave as he was um, as he was surrendering. There were there was the germ the the um that's right I um, that. Damien Lewis's um Damien Lewis's character I can't remember what his name was now in um what his character's name was Winters. in Band of Winters yeah Winters yeah um they he kept having that flashback of killing the young German uh soldier with a uh you know it almost looked like like there was there was that moment where the german soldier kind of looked he like stands up and he looks at him kind of almost smiling and then realizes oh crap that's the enemy and and then damian lewis's character is like oh crap that's the enemy i have to shoot him uh yeah so there there weren't those types of moments for me in um, pacific right well I, maybe okay, so there I think- weren't in reality you know, I think maybe it's back to what Kirk was saying. This is a very different theater. They yeah. didn't get the yeah. chance True. to know at all. It's just, they just came at them like bombarding, running at their machine guns. That's what they knew of them. And and they that's true because they were also so kind of dumbfounded by like, why do they keep coming? And don't they yeah. know that the war is over? And uh, and I think one of them had a really great line that, that said, well, the emperor is God. So- you know, That's, they're, they're going to uh, do whatever God says. Rami Malek's mm-hmm. character says that. You, yeah. And I, and it's a very different culture. And I think Jennifer, that's, that's exactly what I would think about is the problem here in terms of their connect, smashing into this very different culture. One of the things about Germany is Germany is like the most Western of all the Western cultures. It's the land of poets and philosophers in the 19th century. Like it's very Western and they're go- so there's there's a lot of some I mean there's a point when they're singing Christmas carols across the yeah at best up right it's like they're they're the same religion I mean mm-hmm. the, in the I think the last patrol and band of brothers the last that episode they're they're talking about how nobody wants to make a mistake on either side the Japanese never have that the Japanese mm. will die to the last man I mean there's a famous story where this this guy was um you know on a, a Japanese soldier was on a patrol in some island and he was found like 25 years later still patrolling like did you ever hear like yeah I would look that yeah, up yeah he, he was found it he was he returned to Japan in 1976 or something like yeah. that yeah it was welcome I might add yeah yeah and it's it just but just like think like just that mentality is so like mind boggling to a western mentality we do not have that in our ecosystem it's just not there right. and i think that is what the artists were trying to convey in the story and it's a hard thing to convey but i think they did it pretty well actually it's just we want the western story more i think that's mm-hmm. a big part of it but the reality is mm-hmm. that this was their war and that's why they wanted to tell the, the war of the pacific is what they dealt with was like, I, I don't know the numbers and I could be 1000% wrong about this. I'm just coming up with this now, but I have a feeling that if you took one of the decor or a couple of decorated guys, combat veterans on either side of the Pacific, the kill count of one would be like a magnitude higher than the other. Like someone at the Pacific probably has a kill count five or 10 or a hundred times higher than a, a active good. Now, I, I don't know if that's true. That's just my perception. But the reason I'm saying that's relevant is like part of what you then have to deal with is the reality of that, that that's what you did, right? Which in the Pacific, a lot of it, you know, the focus of the movie, or I'm sorry, the Band of Brothers, the focus of the movie, that show in particular, but was the the forging bonds of what makes us all human coming to heal from this standpoint. There wasn't really a healing from Japan. I mean, there really was. I mean, Japan had to heal. And they had their own way of dealing with it historically, but we didn't have to. 
feel from that in the same way. I, although the soldiers did, and nobody talks about it. And it's just the, a savagery that I don't know if it's as savage in Band of Brothers. It's definitely not in the literature and the stories, the same kind of savagery that they experienced. And I think which, that's an important point to make, which I, I sort of forgot about, which is the, the European theater occupies a, a huge space in our consciousness. And we know the Pacific theater was happening at the same time. Um, but we what we forget is that a lot of those guys came home when the fanfare was over. So not mm -hmm. only were they traumatized, there's there's a healing process that went with VE Day. Yes. Yeah. Tape parades and there was a a social acceptance for where they were and what they did that the that the marine coming back from Guadalcanal or Midway or or Iwo Jima did not get. So there he didn't have this 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 the balm let's say of that kind of mass acceptance. But you, you talked about other thematic elements because I thought the war is hell, the romanticization of war versus the reality of war is a great, great thematic element that they did do very well, I think, at at um, sort of portraying through the narrative that, that theme. But what I think sneaks in, which, which, which I said earlier, is the durability of the human spirit, because there's literally not one person in, in uh, Marine uh, Division One that I thought was going to make it after, not after the battle. Like, I thought they were going home you, you mean to tell me Snafu was going to have three kids and get married yeah. in normal life? No way. Yeah. There was, there was <laughs> no a way. single one of them that was going to live a normal life. Yeah. And so what, what serves as the balm for us at the end is to see the real characters and where they wound up in history and to, to hear that all of those guys that we lived with that we thought were going to be basket cases in the States became fairly successful uh, people. Yeah. We had well, kids. we have to be. We have to. We, have we don't to, know. But yeah, we, it's like the Instagram we, biography, and yeah. who knows, like how they would have described your stepdad. Exactly. Really we had three kids. They, they worked as the Los Angeles yeah. time, but they didn't have to live with what I had. Held to live his with. family hostage. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Thank himself into the well, movie. I mean, that's a good point about like the the kind of from a storytelling standpoint, that's a different story, and we have had that story told the PTSD. And I think it's an important story because the effect it has on the children, the families, that's something that's not explored here at all. We just see these kind of, like you're saying, Mark, in the kind of portrait at the end, we have the, you know, a, a snapshot Instagram story of their lives, which they did have a quote unquote level of success in their life. They had kids. Uh, Sledge has a, a family. He gets a PhD in biology so he does figure out his life because it ends with like, we don't know what he's going to do. I, I, by the way, I thought one of the most powerful lines in the moments in the story was when Sledge, again, all of this happens in episode 10. I really like episode 10 is when Sledge is trying to find out what he wants to do with his life. And he goes to that college. Right. And he, he's like, <laughs> and she's like, well, did you do this or do that or do this or do that? Like, and what did the Marines teach you? And I think that's an important thing mm -hmm. that these guys like that, who gave all they were actually college taught. was Auburn by the way it just wasn't called that back then oh really okay <laughs> yeah yeah what'd well, you say Jen that college was Auburn by the way it just wasn't oh, called that oh, back then. okay that's so so oh cool that's your alum uh, so like they, they asked like what did this school teach or what did the the Marines teach you and he's like well they taught me how to kill Japs and I got really good at it and of course his delivery I thought was bone chilling yeah. and Especially, by the way, I also have to say that is one of the best casting I've ever seen because he is the most innocent looking human I've ever yes. met. And that I think is supposed to be Sledge's whole thing. Like he looks like a baby boy. He's a boy. After. Yeah, but, yeah. Mm -hmm. but they're all boys, even Sid. Yeah, but he but, looks like a, he just he looks, looks like a boy. Yeah, he looks so innocent. He, even after mm -hmm. the war, he looks super innocent. And yet you knew that this was a cold blooded killer. Mm -hmm. which I think is true. Like a lot, it's not like every cold blooded killer, killer on our side, at least or on any side who goes off to war looks like what you might think of cold, blooded. like these are just normal people. Right. And they mm -hmm. just did extraordinary things. And I thought that he was I, a good person for that. I thought it was interesting when he was, was back Two two things that I really enjoyed about, um, about Sledge's arc was I really enjoyed seeing um, or appreciated, I should say. I really appreciated seeing the family dynamic with his mom and dad. 
uh, because his dad, you know, has has seen. Uh, was his dad in World War One, or did he just treat people? I think he just treated. Like he treated people. Yeah, I don't think he was um, actually fighting in it. Not that I was it like a medic in in the war, but it, so his his dad maybe. is so fearful. You know, his dad has seen PTSD. I don't even. The, then I think they they called it shell shock. Yeah, um, shell but, shock. But uh, his. Uh, and and when he's having nightmares after Sledge gets home and he's having nightmares and his father's just outside the door that mm. like I'll probably cry if I start to describe it anymore because it totally just like I was like crying and yeah. um, but he's he understands he, he has this very deep level understanding and then uh, of his son and then he's sitting under the tree Sledge is sitting under the tree wearing kind of like his John Lennon sunglasses gangster mom, glasses. The mom comes out and says, you look like a gangster. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, that couldn't be any, it it's, it couldn't be any further from the truth, but it's also kind of the truth too, because, mm -hmm. you know, he did kind of, he did become a gangster in the war. Yeah. Uh, no and, gangster uh, has a body count like Sledge, promise you. Right, right. No, no American and, gangster. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and, and then that moment when he goes hunting with his father uh, and drops his gun and, you know, and, uh, and then, and then his dad is like, well, I think the dove population will be a little bit happier, oh, yeah. you know, today. That was such a great moment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think the theme is actually, and I don't know how to formulate it. Maybe you guys can help me, but it has more to do with glory, honor, and the reality of war. And that, that's how I kind of hold it in my head. Because the, the reason I say that is like, so much of the story and the arcs have to do with each of these three characters' relationship to honor and glory. And it starts off that way in, in each of the, the characters. I mean, John Bass alone, like the whole point of him is he is one of the most glorious of all the char of all the soldiers of World War II. He's one of the most honored men in World War II. Um, they name highways and they have to this day they have Bassalone Day in uh, New Jersey in the, his what's the city in New Jersey. Um, where he's from. And that's, I mean, that's the whole point of him is in, in, the, in the sense of this story is he's this guy who's honored for his actions on Guadalcanal. He comes home, we see him boinking starlets, right? And he's having all that fun, but he's feeling all this guilt and he wants to live a good life and to do right. So he goes back, which is ridiculous. Like after sleeping with all the, the, I was going to say blondies, but I have two blondies on it. You know, with all the, the, the uh, hot They were blonde, hotties. that's accurate. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, with all the hotties, and he's having, a, he's like living it up. He's He's got his own You have sweets. three blondies, by the way. Well, he gets, I mean, yeah. like the stories that are told even here, I don't know him, I don't know much about him historically, is that he was with a lot. Like he would le go in with the blonde, come out with a brunette, is what one, is what uh, Lena, yeah. uh, his, his wife says at one point, right? I mean, he's, all doors are open for this guy. The whole world is his oyster, literally. And uh, I mean, I don't, I, I can't even imagine like a famous A-list actor today having the level of fame that he had and, and the doors open. Maybe they do, but man, I mean, and then he decides to go back and then he fights in probably, or I think it is the most brutal war battle in the entire war and he dies. Now, what's and then of course there's that and and again in episode ten what's the finale, Lena giving back the medal of honor to the mm -hmm. father, right? Which I cried every time every time I see that. Right? It's, <laughs> it's a beautiful scene. Yeah. Sledge, what's his story? He wants to get honor in a sense. You know, he knows the stories of his father. He knows Barrack Room Ballads by Rudyard Kipling. This is all about stories of men going to war and honor, and he wants that. He gets the glory in a sense, and he doesn't want it. Sledge has to deal with a certain kind of relationship to glory, which is the psychological damage that it does to him. And he actually does use it to some degree. I mean, it's a great scene, again, episode 10, when he uh, goes up to Vera's door in his dress blues, which he never got to war. They made jokes about it. Like yeah. their mother's like, should I send you your dress blues? Like they're in the mud and piss and crap and yeah. like, what am i gonna do with my dress blues this was there? lucky right lucky, yeah, this is yeah. lucky and vera who he eventually and he's standing outside her door that west point boy comes in and the west point boy like you he's know he's mad war. but he is like what's he gonna do this guy has all the honor and glory even though he doesn't uh -huh. have money, he has all the honor to me that is like a big like that is an encapsulating part of this story and it's the reality of honor and glory and of war 
I think that's what they tried to explore with these three different characters, which is very different than the thematic cohesion of the fraternity of Band of Brothers. Where And part of, I think, why we love that story a little bit more is because that allows for, a, that, that story of the fraternity of Band of Brothers allows for more, for lack of a better word, heart. Like there's, there's more, like there's the positive cohesion. It's not just all this destruction and devastation and like trying to make love with an Australian woman, which is beautiful. But then because she thinks you're going to die, she get, quits, you know, uh, leaves you and says, you can't come I hated back that, by the way. To, I, yeah, I, I'm sure that happened really, though. That probably yeah, happened. Yeah, no, I just didn't like that they, um, I, it just didn't ring true for me. It it came out yeah. of the blue. It, um, and, and it was so odd because here Lucky is writing to Vera at the same time. He's writing to Vera, who he eventually marries back home. But at well, the he same doesn't actually write to her, but okay. He writes letters to her. He doesn't send them. He never, yeah. but still he's writing to her. I, it, like whether, he's emotionally whether they get, connected to her. Exactly. Sure. He's got a, an emotional connection to her. And then he, you know, falls for this Australian girl. And it just seemed like, you know, just... I don't know. It was I, I didn't see how that served the story very well because all it did was it it distanced me from Lecky. I just kind of thought he was being a little lechy. Uh, um, By the way, you don't think that a guy who's going through what he is going through should try to find a love in his one chance? I don't. I'm sorry. I, I don't. I don't know, buy that at all. Because like I he, just didn't buy. No, I just didn't he buy. He's gonna that die. There. Like he thinks more than any of the other characters. I mean, I, they all think this. But he really has committed to like, I'm going to die. This is it. I'm not going to make it. Yeah. And he even says that when he goes to the, the thing, like, I, yeah, that one I don't agree with. Like, it just, I think... it just didn't ring true for me, though. I, I don't know okay. why. It just there's didn't re ring I true. I think there's he reasons wasn't in love. That, that are, I think there's reasons for that that are technical that we can talk about later. Because to actually, episode three was one of my favorite episodes because it, yeah. it was it was, you know, you you get to see Barcelona being torn about getting this fantastic honor, but having to leave the men behind that he's he's sort of become the, a, a leader to. And you get to see a guy like who has who has a family that's so remote, so emotionally removed. He's he, the guy's never really experienced love or acceptance. He got lost in the pack of his own family. And you see how emotionally remote his father and mother are from him at points during the script to actually see somebody who sees him and a family who incorporates him. It was almost too much. Like I was on his, I was in his skin going, Oh, there's something, something's going to give here. This does, yeah. it's not just that this, uh, not just a narrative element. I think there was a technical reason that has to do with the acting, why you couldn't get on his page, at least. At, and I mm -hmm. had mm -hmm. with it as well, even though the story mm -hmm. itself, I'm a huge romantic, Interesting. that kind of thing really um, affects me normally. But I, I, you know, I, I wanted to to get to your point though, Kirk, of uh, the you know, the relationship of honor and glory, and all the characters sort of are related to the concept of honor and glory as well. That to me falls back to that the the the, the main theme of uh, you know the reality, the the uh, idealization of and the reality of war. Now, ideals stick around for a, for a long time if there's elements of truth to them. So. So certainly that, you know, the, the fact that these men became heroes in, in the eyes of, of the world, you, you can see as an incentive to keep this, this sort of machine, the machine going, right? Because um, they're the real deal, unlike the West Point graduate who hasn't seen any action. He hasn't been put through, he hasn't been put through the, uh, you know, the stage of the, the, the trial by fire. You know, it's a sort of a, a christening for a man. And it's a it's a, that's a reality of war whether we whether we like it or not there's a certain amount of respect that a man gets for going through a trial by fire mm -hmm. there's a certain level that that person achieves that that somebody else doesn't achieve and i i would be interested in your thoughts on Barcelona. and i mean he's the he's the hero of the story he comes fully baked in a sense he, he doesn't really have an arc but he meets the woman of his dreams. I mean, he throws away celebrity and status. Mm -hmm. and even the woman who he really loves is this genuine, down-to-earth, hard-hitting woman um, who could be sort of a Rand hero in, in many respects. So she takes no mm -hmm. bullshit. She has her own standards. She's, She's not a Marine herself. 
He's yeah. a Marine. She's not smitten by his celebrity. She's all about mm -hmm. his character. And when when he proves his character, he has to prove himself to her. Mm -hmm. He has to prove himself on the Step battlefield. Up. He admit, and he Step wins up. Her. That's a very, very powerful moment to me. Now, what do you think about giving that up? I mean, it, part of me went, you crazy bastard. Yeah. I, a little crazy. Go ahead. Uh, Jenna. Well, I, I think there's, um, it's def it's definitely why they included his story. So, I mean, one thing about the, on a background of the whole story is the Pacific is based on two books, actually, <clears throat> unlike Band of Brothers, which is just Stephen Ambrose's uh, Band of Brothers. This one is based on With the Old Breed at Pelilu in Okinawa, Okinawa by Eugene Sledge and Helmet for My Pillow by Robert Leckie. So it's mm -hmm. it's actually their two stories are the primary source material. The John Bassalone story is added on. Now, I don't know. I don't know the background of why they did that. My assumption is because they were trying to pull out a broader theme. And this is why I think it kind of falls apart. And it doesn't land as heavily because they're trying to do too much almost. But mm -hmm. I think the whole point of his character is, again, goes to the uh, of that his arc goes to the whole core of what these men gave up. And it shows that, you know, for the honor and glory that was present at World War II is that John Barcelona gives up all the, the honor that he gets after Guadalcanal, all the starlets, all the doors open. And he does that for, you know, first for a, a, a woman in a sense, for uh, Lena. But he also gives her up for glory. I like, think it's more about it? integrity. I, I think he no, never but like felt, he did his he, part. He, is the thing. he said though, I don't feel like a hero. He never felt well, they like not, he deserved they always, that yeah. honor. And I think he yeah. wanted to go back in order to deserve it. Okay. So I think that look, getting into the psychology of these men is very difficult. I don't know what his real thinking was in why he did this. I I, I suspect you're correct. But the issue to me, the, one of the issues is that he had clearly done his part. You know, he's feeling guilt. They all feel guilt. He's also getting rewards that nobody else gets rewards for. So I think, yes, there is an element of guilt that's there, which I think is unfortunate because I think that takes, in terms of the story, because it takes away from that he did make the decision to join the boot camp men that he was training to go off back to war, even though he just got married. So he just got married and he could have waited for the future, but he just wanted to go with them. Now, I don't know if I it's did, even clear I, of why he did it, but see, I think, assume. I think, you know, I think it's also simple. Sometimes the simplest answer is the best answer. And wh what did he discover over in Guadalcanal? He's a super good soldier. He's very effective at what he does. Yeah. And he tried to transmit that to students, but it wasn't satisfying enough. And so he, you know, so in a sense, he didn't feel he was, necessarily contributing what he could because he discovered he's a good soldier and so he thought the best way to go to 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 go back was to do what he was good at and there there's that yeah that's i, I think it's like winters like winters found his his i mean you know whatever winters was before he became battlefield commissioned all the way up to colonel which is a crazy amount of battlefield commissions he was just super good at what he did and yeah. so he found his, his life purpose. I feel like Barcelona found his life, life purpose. purpose. Yeah, I think he rec I think mm. he represents um symbolically, he represents the the kind of career military man, but not just not just a military man, but he represents he he kind of almost existed to be in to be at war. Like his, it was almost like his, his essence of a, of a human being, his identity is a soldier in a war. And, and it was something that he learned about himself. Um, you know, when he, the, when he, um, the machine gun, right. When he picks up the machine gun and burns his hands and, and mm -hmm. that's how he gets his medal of honor. Right. Because he ends up just like massacring a, a, a massive amount of Japanese and, and it never, he, he never, becomes 
like Snafu's character where he's where he's jaded. He he kind of always he remains a good man. His soul is always intact. And I think it was a really interesting contrast between the woman that he married versus the woman that Lecky wanted to marry, the the Australian woman who mm. didn't you know, breaks up with him because she knows that he's got she believes that he's going to die. And Lena though who like they've been married for 7 months. And he and he died after that. But you don't ever see her. Um, obviously, she's upset about that. But you don't you don't you know, when he decides to go back to where they don't have any kind of scene where she's angry about it or upset. She she gets it. She understands. Yeah, she who knows he who he is, is at his essence. And she never marries again after that. Right. Yeah. Um, oh, that was sad. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think that my grappling with the story is the complexity of these three different storylines and what are they all trying to add up to is to me what the, the question because again that that's what i'm struggling why i think wow. it is as good as the story is i think it's a story that needs to be told uh like uh -huh. vietnam like korea like these are uh, these are aspects of the american history that we don't get much in my view is you know we get a lot about d-day we definitely hear a lot about Hiroshima, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but we don't, you know, Jax, you were talking about this before. We don't really see the visceral aspect of what it took and what it was going to take to get there to Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And I don't know if you guys want to talk a little bit about this, but like one of the aspects of this war that becomes clear in this story and that's based on real accounts is the that the this is a culture this is an alien culture to us and we were at war with an alien culture that was something we don't we can't fully wrap our heads around none of them can wrap their heads around none of the soldiers can figure it out now it's we're not looking at the president and the the intellectuals at the time that's not what this is about but people didn't know what they were dealing with and you know, when, when an opportunity, you know, when you're faced with the biggest body counts on both sides of the Pacific, uh, of, of the war, they're happening here. It's the most brutal. Every inch is, and you see it and feel it. Like, that is one thing I felt when that woman comes out with her baby and she blows herself up to try to kill them. I mean, that's not happening as far as I know in the European, although, they, of course, they're doing their own thing with Jews, obviously. So they're doing just as horrific or more in that level. So it's, well, I don't even know how to wrap my head around some of it, but the point is that I think there's the real, there's the, for me, wrapping my head around the Hiroshima Nagasaki necessity of that, that it needed to happen is you, to some degree, you need to see like what they were up against. For sure. Just, and you know, they say the Gaza war is the first time the population has ever been used as an instrument of war by, by, by the, by Hamas. And that's not true. And you, who said, is yeah. that really people's things say that today? Yeah. I think your own has even said something about Hamas is the, the first time that the population is used as a, as a shield, as a sort of device to win the war, as opposed to something mm. that protected and defended, you know, even, you know, uh, mm. I mean, the Germans had the war machine and they cycle people, you know, the collectivist or societies certainly have less value for life and they're willing to churn out soldiers. Russia's willing, willing to churn out more soldiers than the American people are, but they, 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 they put them into the military system. They don't use them as, as right. PR. are. And, huh. and in this case, you know, you, you had Japanese soldiers doing what you could imagine Hamas soldiers doing hiding right. within a crowd of civilians so that they could take out a couple of uh, Marines before they're, before they're taken out or booby trapping a baby or uh, a mother and a child that would go in to go up to an uh, IDF listening post. You'd see that happening today. So it's less surprising to uh, anybody who's acquainted with the Gazan war today mm -hmm. to, 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 to confront the, 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 the phenomenon of using civilians as as war shields or as a means of uh, beating the enemy, but we see it there. And you're right. I think you do need to see it because Okinawa is a Japanese island. They're they're no longer in the Solomon Islands off yeah. of uh, 
off of Australia. They're no, they're no longer in Malaysia. They're not in, they're not in any other country. They are actually in a, a Japanese stronghold and heading towards the mainland. And you, you see how tenacious those folks were. I mean, what you don't see is the the artillery bombardments of these these mazes of caves that were in volcanic structures, volcanic mountains that were impervious to any of their artillery barrages. So these men would have to go in and face essentially, you know, unharmed and very, very upset, uh, you know, uh, Japanese soldiers who were ready to die for uh, for their cause. Yeah, and I, I that's... um again, to me, goes to a core of what they were trying to do with de-romanticizing, because even though Band of Brothers was brutal, there still is a little bit of a... To me, it's a little romanticized in the sense that you have an enemy across from you that you're fighting, in a sense, right? Here, you don't have that. Like they're like Mark was saying, they're playing psychological tricks. Their goal is not to you know, tell a good story. And their goal is to slaughter you. They hate you. They, they just like, that's the Japanese goal. And they just want to kill everybody. They don't care how they kill you. They don't care if they strap, like, you know, there's one, I think episode one or two where they, that guy, uh, a Japanese soldier who's dead, he doesn't surrender or he's not dead. <laughs> he's maybe a little bit wounded. He, he doesn't surrender. They're capturing him as a POW. Americans are famous for being good to their POWs in comparison to everybody else. And what does he do? He blows up a bomb to kill himself and two Marines, right? right. Like that's just, I mean, I'm, I don't, I'm sure that happened with Europeans on some level, but the idea of kamikaze, the, the this, the suicide life thing is just really unique. And I think this story is trying to de-romanticize this because there, it, we do in our, we, there's more movies made about the European uh, theater of war there's more books written about it there's video games like it's just there's more of it we do have a romantic because it is kind of like here's an enemy here's us we kind of we cross the battlefield there's the hero like uh winters running across and he shoots that right and he takes out a whole regiment and it's there's that the japanese people were hidden in, in tunnels and they would pop out shoot at you get slaughtered go back and they'd go like it's just a very it was way more thing. like guerrilla warfare. Right? Oh, it was definitely it, guerrilla um, warfare. It reminded yeah. me. It reminded me of you know some of the some of the battles in Vietnam. It the the, yeah. the Pacific like the 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 nature of that kind of war in the Pacific reminded me more of Vietnam than actually the European World War Two. Well, like the cab driver uh, who dropped off Lecky. Remember what he said? He said uh, out at the way home. He said, "I may have dropped into Normandy, but you." What did he call them? Like a, a gyrene or something like that. Um, a GI, uh, gyrene. Yeah. Like yeah, GI. Rain, like yeah. gyrene who jumped into the jungles. You didn't even like, I got to like, I basically got to hang out in Paris and London and, and yeah. <laughs> you guys just got jungle rot. And yeah, I think that malaria and malaria. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's a part of the story that's, you know, we just don't know about today and it's, we should know about it. And I think that's why this is, a good story. Well, and it's, I, it's I, hard I, for them I to think make. it's, but yeah, sorry. I think it's it. important to, sorry, I'll, I'll just, I think it's important to know that and, and to know it in kind of a graphic way that, you know, that, that it was shown because there is this in today, especially, you know, when we just saw like Oppenheimer was just released, there's this um, misbelief that the Japanese were on the verge of surrendering, you know, that we didn't, you know, the, the bombs did not need to be dropped. They were on the verge of surrendering. But when you actually see the nature of that enemy, um, it, it brings, I don't know, I feel like it gets you closer to understanding why we did drop the bombs. Um, and uh, you could make arguments about, did we need to drop both bombs? Did we need to drop them directly in the middle of the cities? Could we have dropped them somewhere else to scare the hell out of them? But you you really need to understand the nature of that enemy yes. and how they were never going to give up. Yeah, not not. I don't know if this is a diversion, but there is some evidence to suggest that the the Japanese were ha had sent out feelers to the Roosevelt administration to surrender, but they wanted to sur they wanted a conditional conditional surrender. Yeah, right. 
So, uh, which in my mind would have been completely irrational. And I, I speak, what was the condition? What was the condition? Ah, jinx. Well, they wanted to. They wanted, they wanted to keep Shinto. They wanted to keep their emperor. They wanted. They essentially yeah, keep their culture. Yeah, they yeah. wanted to keep their culture. They wanted the the military infrastructure to be unchanged. They wanted. They, they didn't. They didn't mm. want Western values to be uh, placed on them. Mm. And I find that very similar to what we're seeing in the Gaza war today, where yeah. I, Absolutely, what's required is an occupation, a, for, a total obliteration of the enemy, an occupation, and the forcing of constitutional norms down people's throats, like like MacArthur did in Tokyo. And well, we're, we're better off, and they're better off. Yeah, we definitely don't seem to have learned the lesson of war from World War II, which we is the opposite that, direction. I think we yeah, saw we the opposite direction. So much slaughter that the the intellectuals tried to think of ways like just war theory, for example, of minimizing civilian slaughter. Um, yeah. You know, and so the, the attempt to civilize war has been going on since the 1950s and it's kept us more or less in a state of constant war. Yeah. 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 yeah so I, I think like the, the lesson that you see here even more than in band of brothers is that war is a war with a culture not with any individual people. And that's something that we, and I would be willing to bet that these filmmakers don't really get that. I don't know, maybe they do. I, it's hard to imagine Tom Hanks and Steven Spielberg being that way, but maybe they are. Um, they definitely recognize that war is devastating to both sides in various ways. They definitely understand that very clearly. They're good at portraying the devastation of war, but like what war is and how it concludes. If you look at all the stories they do, it's always happens in the background. The war is like this, you know, they're like the episode 10, I have to say, and it starts, I mean, this should just be our, our talk today should just be about episode 10, <laughs> but episode 10 of Pacific starts. Anybody remember how it starts? The opening sequence, they're in a hospital and a uh -huh. Isn't isn't the girl uh, the the girl reading to the yeah or, Lecky's reading Lecky's, the comics and what is she reading? She's she's reading uh what yeah what's she reading? The Iliad. That's the Iliad. That's right. She's yeah, reading. She's uh, reading the found, Iliad, which and I thought is, was great. And what is he doing? He she's like, what does she say? You're not listening to me, right? Which is very different than him and Sledge at the beginning, probably. Which is the romanticized aspect of it. They don't, he doesn't care. He just wants to be, you know, that's, that's one thing I took about that. By the way, I, and she's even telling him the what she's reading from the Iliad is something about the band of brothers idea. And he doesn't really care. You know what? I, <laughs> Which I thought was interesting. You may be right, but I, what I found particular for anybody who's read the Iliad, it's, it's surprisingly graphic. Oh Yeah. A surprisingly graphic tale of war. So it's not like, you know, you think with you're going to get a tale of of heroes of great archetypes, and they're in there. And they're you know the the, the main struggle of the story is is between Agamemnon and and uh, Achilles. But the tales of the battles themselves, I don't see how anybody would would take them as as representing a glorified picture of war because they are graphic and surprisingly. Yeah surprisingly graphic and horrible. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a good connection between the Iliad and this story in that sense. Which is a and, combination of, say, the ideal and the real? Is it, as a, as Well, a... it's... So, like, yeah, in the Iliad, there's the, the gross slaughter that you're talking about, where, and it's described vividly. And just like you see it here... And the Iliad, of course, he uses words, but there's a lot of spears going through groins, spears going through throats, you know, and, and the descri descriptions of the impaled body, like he's impaled to the ground like a tree, and like all these different, any, like any way you can imagine a soldier dying in a war like that, it's described, you know, bows or arrows through eyeballs and out the other side. It's brutal. And I, th I think there he's Homer's doing this on purpose to show you the reality of war. At the same time, there is a whole battle in the background about or or honor and glory. I mean, that story is yes. about honor and glory. And so yeah. it's like, well, there's honor and glory that we're trying to fight for. And we're trying to get honor and glory by doing these battles. Here's what the battle is actually like, which is this brutal. So it's like a weird conflict that you, 
need this destruction and devastation to get honor and glory, but it's like the most disgusting, horrible thing. And I think you see that a little bit in this story here, which is why I can imagine the creators wanted to throw um, an homage to this. Okay, so um, how about some final thoughts on the Pacific? I wanted to say why I think Jax couldn't get into the love story, because um, I had... Sure but they often affect the viewer unconsciously. And that's when the actors are forcing things. Yeah. When they're, when they're playing relationships as opposed to experiencing relationships, you as a viewer step outside yourself and uh, you can't engage. Mm -hmm. uh, and I found narratively it's a force because this woman just takes her to her house and he meets the parents and it's so awkward and strange, even for a person who doesn't have intimacy issues like Lecky, <clears throat> it's, it's odd. But the way they tried to for it was as if the director said, smile at each other a lot when you see each other, because you guys just you guys are mm -hmm. really resonating on the same chord, just like you're in love. It's love at first sight. And so they were playing that all the time. And it was like, mm, maybe. Yeah. Whereas, whereas when Lena and, and Bat was would look at Barcelona, you could see her really changing. You know, when she's on the beach with him and she sees what he does when he gets her hat out of the water, <laughs> you see her shift internally and it's because it's because i know her i know annie parisi who played the part uh -huh. and she's actually having the experience of shifting and falling in love with the man and you see it they're not showing you it they're doing it and you as the audience can relax and invest it with in the relationship with them well can i ask you a quick question um before we wrap up here so do you think there's any chance that part of that was intentional by the actors and the filmmakers in the sense that the story of Lecky and the Australian girl is supposed to be a heightened, I'm going to die, you know, like this intense, unreal, to some degree, love affair. It Whereas is. when he looks at her, so I, I'm not an actor, I don't know this, but when he looks at Vera at the dinner table and all the chaos, are like, oh, I don't want to buy television sets because blah, blah, blah. And he like, and they they do the prayer and then he's looking at real. Vera. I was drawn into that because yeah. that was real. Because that was he, real. That's my point. Her. Yeah. Just, now and Vera was looks good. At Vera was good. Uh, yeah. The, the other girl who was pushing a relationship and probably compelled him to push a little bit too. Vera was totally herself. She was yeah. totally in the moment. And when she looks at him and he looks at her, that if that's an actor who's easy to get lost in. And, and so the moment when he sort of excludes the whole family and just focuses on her as his new yeah. love, that was that was a great moment to me. I like that. But that, coming... that's my point about the fundamental theme about reality and romanticism. Like Lecky has been romanticizing her when she, like by writing letters he's not actually sending. He She says at their first date, you don't really know me. And he's like, I guess I don't. And then when reality hits, he's like, well, I don't know what I'm doing, really. Right. And then he's like, yes, I, I do. Like, so I, I think that's there's something. And, that's, that's but my thematic. question, of, but my question to you about the acting though, is do you, is it possible that the, the fakeness that's kind of experienced? And I agree. There's a level of like, it's so heightened. It's like a melodrama. It's like a, a romantic. Um, I don't know. It's, it's like the, the guy has his shirt off in one of those romantic novels or what are they called? The, uh, that you find at a bookstore. Oh, yeah. Or yeah, like like Javier, like it's 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 so heightened. It's like that versus the Vera thing. They're it, they're all of a sudden at the very end. There's an injection of reality, and then it's real. But, but, but here's the idea. I see what you're saying that the, the, the heightenedness makes it sort of artificial, and that they're it's just that it's it's not real, and sort of they're they're falling into that. No, the the heightenedness. Look, the height the heightenedness makes it more difficult to act. Like there there are two parts. Um, Hamlet and Othello that I don't see how anybody could do eight days a week mm. it, because it's so heightened. The emotions are so incredible that you can't possibly bring yourself to those heights every day of the week without wanting to die. Daniel Day-Lewis tried it. He walked off the stage in the middle of a performance because he wow. just wasn't experiencing it. Um, because the actor is left with either I achieve the heights or you know, there's a play called Danny in the Deep Blue Sea by John Patrick Shanley. Same thing. You don't have that John Turturro did it on Broadway. You don't have that, what Danny's experiencing through the play, it falls apart. The whole thing doesn't make sense. So the actor feels under a tremendous obligation to feel. And unfortunately, that's the death of good acting. 
Now, something really profound was stirring between Vera and Letke in that final scene that that was was lovely. Um, but you would have gotten on Letke's side in, in Australia had the same thing been off, had he thought authentically fell in love with that girl and has she authentically but fell she, in love? But they didn't is my point. That's no, the whole they, point of no, it. No, but they did. They did. You're okay. supposed to believe that they did. That's the I thing. Think that's 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 even if, even if it's a you, summer romance, even okay. if it's, you think Romeo two, and Juliet two against two. You, 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 don't think, <laughs> you don't think you don't think Romeo and Juliet were authentically in love? I mean, it's I a kind of love, but it's not the same love. kind of permanent love. Like it's war right. love. It's it's yeah. like but it, it's infatuation. It's deep it's, infatuation. Anybody who's been in the throes of being in love with somebody that even if it dies in that moment, you know, you'd probably go through machine gun fire for that person. So yeah, the, the, yeah. The and problem that I have do, was I don't. I never felt they the do, loss. Everything they do is poetry. I'm I, sorry. But look, Stanislavski once- I agree with what you're saying. There. Stanislavski once talked about the problem of acting love. How do I act love? Because most actors want to go, I'm in love. And <laughs> that's not how you act love. You act love by attention. It is a problem of attention. And that's exactly mm. what he did in the final scene when he just goes into her. That's beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, we need to do a love away. story next. I think. Let's do a love story. Let's do a love story because we got we got to get going. I, 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 th I find it's very interesting. I love rom coms, and you know, I I'm, I read books like Love in the Western World. Uh, I read a lot of romantic literature, so I'm interested in this. Um, we got I think one more minute, Jax, Jennifer. Do you have a last second thought before we sign off? I'll say because of this discussion, I might be like moved a little bit up because there was some depth to it. I think what made it down was I kept comparing it to Band of Brothers and yeah. it's not fair. And in and of itself, I think it's it's a good piece of art. All right. I moved someone or we moved someone 20% up or so. Jax? I, and I, I highly recommend The Pacific and Band of Brothers. I think that these two shows, I'm, I'm really eager to see what, um, what's the next- uh, Masters of Air? I'm really interested to yes. see, uh, uh, eager to to see what that's going to give us. But both of these both of these shows are very important, I think, for different reasons. Um, you know, one is the the Band of Brothers for reasons of camaraderie, and and the Pacific for just like um, being immersed in 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 this terrible terrible war, fighting a different, um, a completely different kind of enemy. So, I mean, I do recommend both. You know, if I was given the choice of two on a desert island, I'm going to choose Band of Brothers. Band of Brothers. <laughs> yeah, for yeah. sure. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for watching The Viewing Room. Um, well, if you have thoughts of what we should be viewing, preferably pro popular movies and TV shows of all time, put it in the comments. We'd love to hear from you. And thank you, everybody, for joining me, and I'll see you next time.